Let's continue with the next screencast in the bootcamp, Python Bootcamp 2 workshop. Uh, in this one, we're going to focus on solving differential equations <clears throat> with various scenarios and types. We're going to start out here by differentiating between two general types of solutions. One is illustrated here, where we have a derivative that's equal to a function only of the independent variable t. And so it's a problem that can be separated. And we can integrate the left side easily to get a y final minus y initial. And then the right side we have an integral that essentially represents finding the area under a curve of f of t from t0 to tf. In the second type, we have a derivative which is a function not only of the independent variable, but the dependent variable. And we use numerical methods to solve this. Uh, and we'll point out here that for most of the models that we derive in chemical engineering applications, uh, analytical solutions are not feasible. So we have to use numerical approaches. So we're going to, this first category here is formally called quadrature problems. So we're going to look at Uh, sim this, one of the simplest ways to solve this, and then we will uh, also take advantage of a more sophisticated method, which is provided by one of the Python modules. Here we're talking about trapezoidal rule, and um, see that there's a P missing there, and I'll fix that later. Uh, and so essentially, between two nearby values of our independent variable, which differ by a step size h, we calculate the area of this trapezoid and use it to approximate the area under this curve, always with a little bit of error. So that area will be equal to the average of our two functions, the midpoint here, times h. And then we can divide up our interval from A to B into a number of interval, intervals H or delta T. And as we do that and move through, we'll find that, for instance, F of A plus delta T is used at the end of the first trapezoid calculation and the beginning of the next. So the interior points here all carry the coefficient 2, and then the beginning and end point do not. And then to get the overall area at the end, we multiply by h over 2, as you can see up here. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go over to Spider, and we're going to create our own function to implement trapezoidal rule. So let's do that, and then we'll illustrate it with an example. OK, so let's pop over to Spider here. And I will, because I'm going to need it later on, I will do my import of the NumPy module. And then I'm going to define a function called trap, and it's going to have the function that we're going to do, perform quadrature on or integrate. It's going to have the beginning and the end values of our independent variable. And then we'll put in a keyword argument, n, which for which we'll set a default value of 100. That means if we do not specify it, it's going to divide the interval a to b into 100 uh, 
intervals, sub intervals. And then we'll uh, start here with X equal to the first interval. And then I will calculate an H value, which is B minus A divided by N. That's our interval width. And then I will start a, a sum, all right, which I will evaluate, for which I will evaluate just the value at A. And then we're going to go through that formula where we're accumulating the sums with a for loop for I in range n minus 1. And the reason we're using n minus 1 here uh, is that we don't want to go all the way to the end because the last value does not have a coefficient of 2. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say that our new value of x is equal to x plus h. And then we're going to increment our sum equals sum plus 2 times 2 times f of x. And that accumulates our sum. And then when we've done at almost to the end, we add to the sum as we did to start with up here, we add to the sum just the single value of f of b. And then the area uh, the area we're going to take equal to our sum times h by 2, all right? And then we're going to return that value from our function. So if we pop back over here to our slide, you can see that we had the initial value at a and all the interior values with a coefficient of 2 and then the final value just at B and the sum multiplied by H over 2. So that's where we are with that. So let's define a simple function to integrate. And I'll make it F of T. And that function is going to be T times NP cosine of t. So it's going to be t times cosine of t. And then we will take uh, a equal to 0 and b equal to np dot pi, value of pi, divided by 2. So we'll integrate from 0 to pi over 2, or 90 degrees. And then we want to carry out the integration, so we'll say y is equal to trap of f going from a to b. And we'll just keep the 100 intervals. We won't change that. And finally, we'll just print the value of y to display it, OK? So let's just see what we've got there. Let's just do, uh, just to be safe, let me uh, save this particular, and let me get to a folder here where I'm saving these files. And I will call it trap function. And now it's saved. And let's try to run it. And there is our answer over in the console to maximum precision, about 
is the area, okay? So that's how that works. Let's come back to the slide and take a look at it on a slide. And there it is. We a little bit different here in how I did it down below, but it's equivalent. Instead of A and B, I put in zero and pi over two as the actual arguments, and then we get the same answer. And I added some comments here on the right just to make a better explanation. This is the differential equation that we integrated, uh, only a function of t on the right, and this is the quadrature integral from zero to pi over two, and that is our result, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to see how we can carry out that same calculation A similar calculation using uh, a built-in function from uh, Python, which is called quad, all right? And so let me come back over here. And in addition to NumPy, let me import from scipy dot integrate submodule import a function called quad, all right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to replace our homegrown function trap with the built-in function quad, which is a more sophisticated uh, method for doing this. And what we will do is we will come down here where we use trap, all right? And we're just going to come in and we're going to replace that with quad. And we need to provide the function, so that's going to be f. And then we need to provide our limits, a and b. And then it turns out that quad actually returns two results, one being y and the other being an error estimate. So I will put in a variable er here for the error estimate, and then we will display it after we display the y variable. And then with this type of arrangement, I no longer need my trap function. So let me just delete that. And then let me do a save as, and I will put in instead of trap function, I will put in quad function, okay? Just so we save the previous version. Now let's see if I can get away with this. And there are our results. And so what you'll see is we have a number here, which is very close to the number with our trapezoidal rule. Looks like it differs in about the fifth significant figure. And it gives an error estimate of, which is negligible, 10 to the minus 15. So of course, if we want to find out more about the quad function, all right, we can get that with our normal help, all right? And, or we can pick it up over here and it gives us more information about all the arguments and everything. And it also discusses or provides reference to the numerical method that is used, okay? So that shows you how we can use our own function trap or use a built-in function called quad, which is short for quadrature. Now let us try another example, all right? And we'll bring that in as a file that is already prepared for you.
and it is this one here. Uh, what I've got it here so I can run it for you, but let's pop back over to the slide so we can see the background. And what we've done here is we have taken the normal distribution in standard form, and the density function is given here. This you will know if you've had a statistics course. And then if we're interested in knowing a probability from this density function, the probability is its derivative with respect to the random variable is equal to the density function. So if we want to know the probability between two limits of z, we would have to take the integral or the area under the curve of f of z between those two limits. There's a special version of that where if we take the integral from minus infinity up to a point, then that is called the cumulative probability of any value of z occurring up to and, and including the value a. And that's, that cumulative standard normal probability is shown in a chart here. And we'll come back now and we'll discuss in spider how we put that code together. So first, we've got the import quad that we had before. And then we've got our matplotlib py plot, because we're going to create a plot. And then we create our function that's going to be integrated. And we do it in the form of an anonymous function or a lambda function instead of a def definition. And you've seen that before in our first uh, Python workshop. And what we say is the independent or function argument is z. And then we provide a formula, which is equal to the definition of the standard normal density. And then what we do here is I am creating a values, not just a simple one, but a values from minus 5 to plus 5. And you will recall that if we do not specify a third argument in linspace, Python generates 50 equally spaced values. And then we can just calculate what the length of that is, and it should be 50. And then for our probabilities out to our different a values, we create an array of zeros. And then we're going to fill that array with this for loop. So we come into this for loop, which goes to range n, which means it goes from 0 to n minus 1. And it's going to fill this array p with probabilities. And each time, what it does is it uses the quad function with our defined function for the standard normal density. And here, I use a little trick in Python where we can actually define a limit for this function as minus infinity, which, practically speaking, means a really, really small negative number, right? Minus infinity, a, a number that's way to the left on the number line. And we integrate that up to a sub i, where that comes from this array, and store it in p sub i. And then when we're done, we create a plot of our p values versus a, and put a grid in and label it. So if we run this and go to our plots, we see that we get a plot of the standard normal density, excuse me, the standard normal cumulative probability. And it essentially starts at 0 and goes up to the end, all right? And uh, provides the curve that we need, OK? So 
Let me take a quick look back over here at our density. One over square root of two pi. Do I have that here? One over the square root, I should have two times pi. It's always nice when you find an, an error. So let me put that in there and regenerate that. And then it shows what it should show, and that is that when we get to the far right, the cumulative probability is equal to 1. And I just happened to note in my previous chart that it was not 1, and that gave me a signal that something was wrong. So I checked it, and I came back, and I fixed it. So there's an, another example of doing a quadrature with an analytic function. And just you may recall, you may not recall, but there is no analytical solution to this inter integral, all right, with f of z being this value over here. So you have to use a numerical value, and that's why in statistics texts you may find tables at the end where it gives you cumulative probability versus z. Okay, so we're going to move on now, and we're going to look at a different type of uh, quadrature, and that is when we do not have an analytical function, but we have a set of data. And this might be like uh, a peak coming off of a chemical analysis unit like a gas chromatograph, and we want to find the area under the peak, but the, the, the actual trace represent a set of data. So we're going to take a look at an example of that in the next slide here. And we're going to use another function called trap Z, all right, from the integrate submodule. And so what we have here is we import trap Z instead of quad. And we have a set of data, T, Y versus T, all right? And now we want to estimate the area under that. So we simply use this trap Z function to do so. And then we make a plot. And here, here is the plot, all right, that we see. And the area computed here is 570.1. So this is over here in a trap Z example file that you can find. And there it is. And so you notice that we print the result here. And then we create a plot uh, which just shows the data and connects the data with straight lines. So you can get a picture of the, the curve under which we computed the area. And so if I run this, it gives me 570.1, which you saw on the slide. And then it creates this plot that shows you where we have estimated the area using trapezoidal rule, but now using it with data instead of an analytical function. So if you're thinking about doing uh, quadrature with uh, Python and built-in routines, it's a good suggestion to use the quad function when you have an analytical expression you're integrating. Uh, and use the trap Z function when you are using the uh, a set of data instead of an analytical function. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, on quadrature. Let's come back over and consider now what we do when we have a differential equation that needs to be solved using uh, numerical method. And the variety of these, starting with the simplest perhaps being the Euler method, and uh, we're not going to spend time implementing that, but we're going to instead use uh, built-in methods that are available from uh, the uh, Python integrate submodule. So I've just 
this is the general situation we have for a single differential equation. We have an initial value, and then we want to integrate this or solve it out to a given uh, point in the independent variable. So here's an example, which is sort of a famous one. It's called a parasitic problem. And the uh, derivative is defined by 5 times quantity y minus t squared. Uh, that is a function of both the dependent and independent variable. We have an initial condition here of y of 0 0.08, and we're going to integrate it from 0 to 5. Now, it turns out that in this case, just to make it interesting, it actually has an analytical solution, and you can solve this by uh, traditional differential equation methods and come up with an analytical solution where y is actually a quadratic equation in time. Okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to show you how we set this up for solution uh, in Python. So let's pop back over there. Let's close out a couple of these. And we're going to open up a file that is called Parasite. OK, so if we look at this, uh, at the top, what we've done is we've defined as a lambda function the, simp the derivative, 5 times the quantity y minus t squared. And you'll notice that when we do this, we indicate two arguments, t and y, to the function in our lambda statement, and that's f. And then, just for comparison purposes, we create an fa standing for f analytical. And this is only a function of t, and it is the quadratic equation. So we can compare our numerical result with our analytical true solution. And then this, this is how we set up for solving it using a function called solve IVP, solve underscore IVP, where IVP stands for initial value problem. And so we set up our span of our independent variable, meaning we go from 0 to 5. And then we say we would like to have results available over that span. We'd like to have 100 results available so we can plot them. And then we create an initial value for y. And then we have a call to solve IVP. And for purposes of illustration, I'm going to comment out this last part and just close it here. And this is typically the way you would do it, where the first argument is the function of, for, of the differential equation. T span gives you start and end. Y0 gives the initial value of Y. And then T underscore eval gives the array of values where you're going to retain the solution. And then when we're done, it provides the solution in an object result. And we can get the T values with result T. And then we can get the Y values with result Y, subscript 0, all rows. All right, and then we're going to plot the numerical solution, and we're going to plot the analytical solution on the same plot. The analytical solution will be a dashed line. So let's see what happens when we run this. Here it is. Now, the analytical solution, I will tell you, if you plug in 5 into that polynomial here, I believe it gives you 27.08 as the value at t equals 5. So our numerical solution ends up at a value of about 28, uh, no, 280,000, 290,000. 
And because of the scale of the axis, our true analytical solution is sitting down here, ending up at 27. So we have a problem. And the problem we have is that this equation is famous for being unstable and very difficult to solve numerically. And the way that we handle that in using solve IVP is we require it to have very tight error tolerances, absolute tolerance and relative tolerance, in this case, 10 to the minus 12. Its typical tolerance is closer to 10 to the minus 6. So we double that logarithmically, and we make it uh, hold much tighter tolerances while it is solving the equations. And then we run that again. And here we've got the analytical and numerical solution going to, as I said, 27.08. And they lie directly on top of each other. So we have developed an accurate solution of the differential equation. OK, so that is, uh, that is how that looks. But the main thing we wanted to illustrate here is how you go about setting up for a solution of a differential equation, single differential equation, using the solve IVP function from SciPy integrate. OK? So let us come back to our slides. And this illustrates the first part of that solution, uh, where the solution is numerical solution essentially blew up. And then we made the change by including the tighter tolerances, and the two solutions coincide. So that's, you know, most of the chemical engineering problems that we solve do not have this kind of a characteristic. But occasionally they do uh, with things like reaction kinetics. And we have to be careful uh, about the ac accuracy of our solution. Just a strategy on that for you is that if you solve the equations without specifying tighter tolerances, and then you tighten the tolerances somewhat, and they yield the same solution with the initial tolerances, then you know pretty much that you have uh, an accurate uh, solution of your equations. So let's go on and look at uh, an example here. And we're going to take one from reaction kinetics. And we're, it's going to be fairly simple, although it actually is taken from a real reaction system, where we have uh, nominal components A and B that react isothermally with the reaction rate K to yield a product C. And it's a second order reaction. Whoops, sorry about that. Come back here. It's a second order reaction. And we have uh, the disappearance of A uh, equal to minus K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. And uh, we have initial conditions for the concentration of A, concentration of B, and concentration of C, which is typically 0. And then we have a rate constant, 14.7, with appropriate units of 1 over concentration, 1 over time. And then we have initial conditions of a value for A, a value for B, which is 1 third of A, and value of C, which is 0. No no product initially. And then from stoichiometry, we can compute as we go along the values for B and C. The value for B, because it's equal molar here, is the initial value of B minus the amount of A that has reacted. And C is the same thing, except for our situation, initial value of C is equal to 0. So the amount of C that we have made 
is just equal to the amount of A that has been consumed, okay? Now, one way that we like to depict these differential equation systems is using something called an information flow diagram. And this simple one looks like this. Uh, and essentially, what we do is we put in a box here our differential equation. And the derivative we send into a magic triangle here, which integrates or solves the differential equation and produces values of A, concentration of A. Once we have the concentration of A, we can compute the concentration of C, the concentration of B, and when we have that, we can compute the derivative. So it shows that we have enough information to compute the derivative and then we denote additional information here with bubbles that are yellow saying that th that is uh, basic data or operating data that we need to um, provide, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to show you how we go about solving this equation uh, and make a plot of the results. So let us come back over to Python here and go looking for a file. And I'll call it simple batch. And we load that file. Now let, let's take a look at it here. So for starters, it's pretty much the same header as we've had before. And then we have our basic and operating data where we have our value for K and our value for CA naught. And this is in the form of an array because of the way that solve IVP works on it. And then CB naught will be also because it is just CA naught divided by three. And then we define a function that computes our derivative. Now here, we got a little bit going on because the function is provided with T and CA, which is our dependent variable, but we're also providing it with three additional arguments, K, in the two initial conditions. With those, we can calculate CB by our normal way, the initial B, B minus the amount of A consumed, and then we can return the derivative minus K times CA times CB. So that is our function called batch. And then we decide we're going to solve this from 0 to 20 minutes, and we're going to have 50 values over that interval with lin space. And then we come in and we have a little bit of a change we make in the solve IVP argument list. And that is that we have batch, our function. We have t-span, our range. We have our initial value of a, all right, up here. And then we put in our t underscore eval which is our array of values of t where we want the solution. But then we add an args argument where we put in parentheses the three values that need to be passed through solve IVP to our batch function, these last three arguments. And then what remains here is fairly simple, similar to the last example. Our time is the, is the t element of the result object. The CA is equal to all the rows of the, uh, all the columns, I should say, of the CA of the Y array with the first subscript. And then 
the CB we can get from the CA array and the CC from the CA array. And then here we make a plot of CA, CB, and CC. We use the label argument so we can have a legend, put in some titles, and then we can run this. And there is the result. And it's color-coded. So what we can see here is that we start with A up here, and it reduces. B appears, excuse me, C appears and levels out, and B starts at one-third of the A value and goes to zero, at which point there's no more B available to react, so the curves all flatten. So let's come back to our slide and summarize that here, showing the script and then showing the plot to the right. And again, it gives you another example of how to set up for the solution of a differential equation. But in this case, we're also carrying along a couple of additional variables, B, C, B, and C, C, which can be computed from the solution of A using our simple formulas. So th that's where you go with that, okay? So now we're going to move along and we're going to talk about the solute when you have more than one differential equation that you want to solve. So we'll use a simpler example uh, for that and then we will move on uh, to an example that is based uh, off the s single equation example we used for the batch reactor, but it actually will describe a real reaction system. So let's c come back over here to our spider, close a couple of files maybe, and open up. And I'm going to open up a file called two ODEs. Here we go. So let's see how we have built up from our previous examples here. In this particular case, we've got a function f, which now supplies two derivatives from two differential equations. And you can see sort of the first dependent variable is y0 and the second is y1. So it has minus 2y0 squared plus 2y0 plus y1 minus 1 and so, so forth for the second differential equation, which is a little different. Uh, we have a, a final time of two units that we're solving. So our span is 0 to tf here. I could have just put 2 in here. And then our evaluation, again, 50 points between 0 and TF. And then for our Y0, instead of a single initial condition, we now require an initial condition for the first variable and 0 here for the second variable. And then we use our solve IVP just as we have before with our function, all right? But now the function is returning two derivatives. As a result, it's going to return two dependent variable solution results. So when we're done, we get our t value from result t. We get our first variable from sub subscript 0 or index 0, and our second variable array from index 1. Then we can go about plotting x1 and x2 versus time. In this case, they're just black curves, and we used a dashed line for x2, and then we have a legend corresponding to the labels. So if we do that and run that, we get our solutions for both x1 and x2 going between 0 and 2, and you'll notice that uh, x1 starts at initial condition 2 here, 
and X2 starts at initial condition zero, and they're both ending up at about one uh, at time equal to two. So that is shows you how we can go about solving two differential equations. And uh, let's pop back over to our slides. And this shows the equations written in an algebraic form, so you can see what they look like. And you can see that each equation depends both on its dependent variable and the dependent variable from the other equation. So the two equations are coupled. And then this shows the code. And then we have the name of the file where this script is located and the chart that we've got. OK? So now we're going to move on, and we're going to take a look at our batch reactor problem, but we're going to make it more realistic. And this problem is actually taken from a couple of papers that are in the literature from a long time ago. And so instead of using the, the names of the chemical constituents, we use A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, because the names of the chemical constituents are actually pretty long. So uh, we just use letters to represent those. And now, uh, instead of just having A plus B goes to C, we have three reactions. A plus B goes to C plus F. And then the C again reacts with A to produce D and byproduct F. And then the D reacts with A to produce E and more byproduct F. So if we write our differential balances for each of these constituents, A, B, C, and D, we get these equations here for second order reactions. A is consumed by all three reactions, so there are three terms. B is consumed by the first reaction only. And then C is produced by the first reaction and consumed by the second. And D is produced by the second reaction and consumed by the third. And it turns out with a little bit of work, uh, you can actually, uh, instead of writing a differential equation for E, which you could do, uh, you can actually compute that using stoichiometry based on the initial concentration of A and the current values of A, C, and D. And that's a little bit of a problem you can work out on your own if you want, a little tricky. And then the amount of, of F that is produced is just equal to the amount of A that is consumed. And we have our rate constant from our earlier example, but then from the literature, we also get the rate constant for the second reaction and for the third reaction. And we have these initial conditions. Uh, and then it, it's, I like to organize these in an information flow diagram to make sure that everything hangs together. And that's what this looks like, where I integrate differential equations for A through D, which means I then have values for A through D. And then I feed those back to make sure that I have all the information required to compute the derivatives. And that also includes being able to calculate E and being able to calculate F. All right? So that's what that looks like. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, just expand the previous example with two differential equations into one with four differential equations. And we're going to create a function called multi-batch. <coughs> and multi-batch is going to have an independent variable t and a dependent array of variables 0 through 3. And those, the first thing we do is we just unpack them into our familiar symbols A through D. And then we compute our four derivatives, again, from the previous slide, and return those derivatives. So that is how we set that up. And 
then we can uh, we'll pop over here to Python and load a function. I believe it's called multi-batch. Multi-batch reactor. And there is the multi-batch function. Here is our basic data, the Ks, and our initial condition, operating conditions, A and B, and C, D, E, and F are all zero. And then now we're going to go from zero to 500 instead of zero to 20, which we did before. And we're going to now have 100 points between zero to 500 instead of just 50 for a little more density. And we set up our initial condition array with the initial value of A and B and then zero for C and D. And then we, let me move this guy over just a bit so you can see that. So then we do our solve IVP with our function, with our T-span, zero to 500, with our initial conditions, all four, our T underscore eval is where we've decided to stop for the solution. And then we have pass through arguments, which are K1 through K3, which you can see up here, that have to get through solve IVP to multi-batch when it calls it. And then when we're done down here at the end, we get our results back from the result object T is the independent variable array. A, B, C, and D are the Y arrays with initial index 0, 1, 2, and 3. Finally, these are all arrays now, so I can compute the array of E and the array of F from these using the stoichiometric relationships that we described before. And now, I'm just layering on here, is that we can create a plot using an array of colors for all six components, all right? And uh, again, with a legend to help us out with a grid and with our titles. So when we run that, we get this plot. Let me back this off just a little bit. And it shows us the progression of the batch reaction and I'll just point out a couple of things here. If you'll notice B here is a red curve and it drops to zero in about 20 minutes. That, that was the original solution we did with a single equation in the batch. And B is called an initiator. What it does is it starts producing C and gets everything off the ground. And then if you'll notice, uh, C here is magenta, and it comes up and peaks, and then it is depleted. And then D is the black line, and it is, may be our desired product, and it maxes out at about 150 minutes. And then E is our, our final value that just increases there, and F, which is sort of a, a byproduct, uh, unnecessary is shown there, and we show our A depleting out, all right, as it goes. So here is an example of solving multiple differential equations, all right, first-order differential equations. And, uh, you know, you can use these examples as patterns as you encounter uh, problems like this which may well be a little more complicated than these, all right? So let's pop back over and come along and look at our code, which we already discussed, and the final part of the code, and the um, graph that it produced, quite attractive graph, all right? So now that's that. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider now how you go about solving a single second order differential equations, differential equation, we're going to throw a little curveball in there. So we're going to look at this. Here we've got a second order differential equation, which involves 
both the first derivative of the dependent variable and the dependent variable itself. And here, what's unusual is that because it's a second order differential equation, we need two conditions, could possibly be two initial conditions. But here, we have said that we want an initial condition on our dependent variable of 5, and then a condition at t equals 10 of 8. So this is called a split boundary condition problem. And we need to try and find the solution to this. So the first thing we do to approach this is we decompose this into two first order ordinary differential equations by defining a new variable y1, which is equal to the derivative of our dependent variable with respect to t. And then we write a differential equation for y1, which is equivalent to the second derivative of y, and then put that in as 1 quarter y1 plus y from up here. But then the uh, situation we're faced with is we don't have an initial condition for y1 to carry out like a typical solve IVP solution. So what we do is we estimate an initial value for y1, which is essentially an initial value for the derivative of y. And then we solve the equations through to t equals 10. And then we check the value of y at t equals 10 and see if it's equal to 8. Uh, and if it isn't, we have to come back and adjust the y1 initial values and repeat these steps until we get the desired value. This is often called a shooting strategy, OK? So we're going to show you how we put this together. And we'll come back over to Python here. And we're going to load a file. which is called two-point BC, and it looks like this. And this doesn't quite solve the problem yet, but it gets us started. So what we're going to do is have our function here, which computes our two derivatives dy1 and dy2, and then we return those, argument of t and an argument of y, which is an, an array of two items. And then our y0, we're starting with 5, and then we're guessing for an initial value of the derivative, or y1, minus 4.4. And we're going to solve this from 0 to 10 get 100 points, plot the result. Very similar to what we've done before, right? Nothing too different there. And we run this. And what we find when we solve this is that the final value of y is approaching 600. Now, if you'll recall, when we go back to our slide, the final value was supposed to be 8 supposed to be way down here. So now what we have to do is we have to adjust this minus 4.4 until we get 8 here. So that's what we need to do. OK? So the way we're going to do that is we're going to go back to a function we've used before, which is the Brent Q function. And we're going to ask this minus 4.4 to be adjusted until the final value of y is equal to 8. So let, let's look at the code for that. And this is a way that you can solve a two-point value, boundary value problem. Let's. Two point value B two point BC one. 
So here we have the same thing we had before for solving our differential equations. But now we go back to what we did before and we bring in the Brent Q routine, which essentially solves a function equal to zero in terms of an unknown. And what we do here is we come down and we say we have a new function, which is going to be a function of of our differential equation solution. And we are going to say that we want to find the value, initial value of y1 or the derivative somewhere between minus 5 and minus 4 with an initial guess of minus 4.4. We want to find that that drives this split boundary function equal to 0. So what is the split boundary function? Here it is. It starts with this initial value for y1, comes through, solves the differential equation, has the tm value, then finds the length of the tm value, and then says, I want the last value of y. Now, because we have zero indexing, that's n minus 1 index. And then I'm going to subtract that from 8. So you'll remember with this first solution up here, our last value was almost 600. So 600 minus 8 is a huge number. And what Brent Q wants to do is it wants to adjust y0, the initial value of y, so that this will be driven to zero, which means our result will be equal to eight. So that's what we're asking it to do. And then when we're done down here, what we're going to do is we're going to solve the differential equation again with the solution that this found. And then we're going to make a plot of it. All right. And you've, you've seen all of this before. So if we run this, this is the result that we get. And you'll notice here that it starts with the initial value of y of 5 and ends up with the desired final value of 8. And the initial derivative value is equal to this number here. Now, you'll remember that we tried minus 4.4 and it blew up. So what this tells you is that the solution to this is really sensitive to this initial value of uh, the derivative of y. And you can see what that solution looks like. So let's come back over. And this shows the code where it blows up, all right, because we just solve it with an initial estimate of minus 4.4. And then we come in and we modify it to involve Brent Q to drive the final value equal to 8. And then we get our solution, which is now met, our final condition. And we get our initial derivative value. And we comment that that initial derivative value is equal to a, uh, is, is very sensitive in terms of if you make small changes in it, you don't get the right value here. And in fact, it can blow up on you. Okay, so that that is a neat solution of a second order differential equation where you decompose it into two first order equations. And then this one also had a split boundary value associated with the second order differential equation. Okay, so now let's move on and we will carry out a... Uh, an example which is a little closer to engineering, chemical engineering, by looking at a countercurrent heat exchanger. Now, here uh, we have two differential equations one for the cold fluid, 
going through the tube and another for a hot flu fluid going through the outer tube. And we have energy balances in terms of Z, which is the distance down the reactor from zero to its length. And we have our heat transfer differential equations. And we have an entering value for the cold fluid here. And we have an entering value for the hot fluid here. Now, one thing you will notice is that this represents a two-point boundary value problem because in order to solve these equations forward in Z, we have to have the value of TH to start with, and then we have to integrate this, okay? So that, that we have to do, and, uh, that, and then when we integrate it with a guess for TH, we have to see if that equals the actual inlet hot fluid temperature. And this shows the relationship between the outside heat transfer coefficient and the inside heat transfer coefficient, okay? So as we put that together, I've got a list of terminology here that I won't go through in detail, but essentially it defines all the variables that we're going to use in the model for this. And you can take a look at that, and I think you'll find that to be all uh, pretty much understandable. And then we've got basic data. Well, we've got this set up the way that we had it before, and we already discussed that. We have basic data where we're going to pick something fairly realistic, where we have an outer tube outside diameter of two inches and an inner tube outside diameter of one inch. We're going to have a length of five meters. Um, these are gauge numbers for the tube that you can use to find what their thickness would be. And then we've got operating conditions where the hot stream is coming in at 50 Celsius, the cold stream at 10. We're dealing with water with its heat capacity. And then we have a hot stream flow rate of a liter per second, cold stream of three-tenths of a liter per second. And we have a heat transfer coefficient given here, okay? So that's what we have. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, uh, with SPIDER, at code that sets up to solve this problem, all right? So let's come back to Spider, and let's open a file. Called Counter Current Heat Exchanger 1, and there it is. It's a little more than we can see on a single screen, but we'll, we'll work down through it, all right? Uh, and generally what I'm doing here is I am converting everything over to SI units. But first thing, we've got our three imports, which should look typical to you by now, where we're going to use solve IVP to solve these equations. And then we've got a function heat exchanger where we've got Z and T. And T is an array of both our cold and our hot temperatures. And then we've got all the rest of these specifications for heat transfer coefficients, areas, mass flow rates, and heat capacity so that we can calculate the derivatives, which we do, and then we return in this array. And then you've got a set of specifications here, which essentially just calculate all of our initial values and, and initial conditions, all right? And then we come down to the bottom here, and we say we're going to go from zero to the length of the heat exchanger. We're going to gener use 100 points to, so that we, retreat, we retain the solution for plotting. And then we have to make a guess for the outlet 
hot temperature at Z equals zero. That corresponds to the uh, two-point boundary value nature of this problem. That is, establishes our initial conditions. And then we set up solve IVP as we have before. And we include this long list of arguments, which if you'll recall up here, are part of the function arguments up here. And they have to get through to HTXR through solve IVP. So this is how we declare those arguments. And you've seen that, that several times now. And so we solve them. Uh, and it always uses T for the independent variable in the result object. So we set that equal to ZS for our distance. And then we extract our results for TC and TH, and we make a plot. All right. Now, you'll notice that we have not done anything here. Uh, we've not done anything to make sure that our solution is equal to the desired inlet temperature of a hot THI, which is 50, all right? So we're going to run this code, and we're going to see that we have curves for our cold stream and our hot stream. And here, we guessed the outlet temperature of the hot stream to be 40. And you'll notice we integrate to the inlet temperature being above 50, maybe 52 or 53. And that's not our requirement of 50 degrees, which means we have to come back. We have to solve it again, adjusting this outlet temperature of hot until this is equal to 50, all right? So it presents the same situation we had with our previous example from the second order differential equation, two point boundary value problem, but it's just in the context of our uh, heat exchanger example, a little more realistic perhaps. So let us go and load another file, which is counter current heat exchanger two. And now you're going to see that we expand this in the same way that we did the previous example. And we bring in Brent Q again to help us out. And we have an another function, find THO, all right? And we have as arguments THO and THI specifications. And so we come in and we have our span we set up before. All right, THO is the outlet temperature. We solve it, and then we compare the result that we get to the specified value of the inlet hot fluid temperature, hot water temperature. So the inlet, the spec is 50, and like the first time through, we got 52 or 53, and we got an error. So then we're going to ask Brent Q to change the outlet hot temperature until the inlet hot temperature meets our specification. And then we have all of our basic data and operating conditions. And then we go to Brent Q and we say, somewhere between 35 and 45, we sort of know it's in here somewhere, find the value of THO, right, so that we meet our condition here of 50. And then we've got one argument that we're passing through, which is our spec on THI, which is 50 degrees. And then when we solve that, we come down and we compute one last solution, which we can then use for plotting, plotting in the same way that we did in that. And we also print out what the hot stream outlet temperature uh, is that we solved for, all right? So that's what that looks like. And if we run that, bada boom, 
we come and we see that now our inlet hot temperature is hitting 50 right on the nose and that our outlet hot temperature, which we started with a guess of 40 degrees, is actually close to 38.8 and that yields the solution of the two-point boundary value problem for the heat exchanger. Okay, so let's go back to the slides and summarize what happened here, and then that will bring to a close our second segment of the Python Bootcamp 2 workshop. So let's come back to the slides. So this was our heat exchanger one, where we just made an estimate of 40 degrees, and we just solved the differential equations. The typical format that you've seen and create a plot of the result. And that's what it looked like. And we, as noted here, we did not meet the requirement for the inlet temperature. Because remember, hot water is flowing in this direction. Cold water is flowing in that direction. So then we come back and we created our fine THO, where we're using that with the Brent Q function. And uh, We've got our basic data, and then this is where we used Brent Q to find the outlet temperature for hot that yields the correct inlet condition for hot of 50 degrees. And then we went on and we created a plot, and now it looks like this, and we note that the hot stream outlet temperature is equal to 38.8 degrees, okay? Now, it turns out that there is another function available in um, Python uh, in, in including the solve I, uh, IVP function as part of that family. And that function, I believe, is called solve underscore BVP instead of IVP, and it's in the SciPy integrate. And what it does is it, it sort of combines what we did with solve IVP and Brent Q. I'm not illustrating that here, but we illustrated amply in our numerical methods text. And if you ever needed help in implementing that particular one, you could find help there, find help online, or you could consult with me. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this segment, and the next segment is going to be somewhat shorter, but it's going to wind up this, the second uh, uh, boot camp module here by dealing with optimization calculations and then curve fitting or regression calculations from applied statistics using Python. So that's it for now.